Now, Woolworth CEO Brad Banducci has announced he's stepping down later this year as the supermarket faces allegations of price gouging. I announced my intention to retire today in August of this financial year. Uh, it's, it'll be eight and a half years as CEO at that point, and as we go into our centenary year, it felt like the time was right to pass the baton to the next generation at Woolworths, and I'm delighted to say that the next CEO of Woolworths will be an internal appointment, Amanda Bardwell, as our managing director of Woolies X right now. Now, the company and Brad Banducci says that succession planning has been in place for a while, since last year even. But it is peculiar timing because this announcement comes just days after a disastrous interview with the ABC where he had a disagreement over whether or not the ACCC's head was retired and he nearly stormed off. Have a look. So Sorry, the former head of the Competition Commission says... Lives, his words are... That retired, we have, by the way. I, I don't think you would impugn his integrity and his understanding of competition law. I'm just saying the world has got much more competitive. He retired 18 months ago. He's not... OK, let's... Well, can we take that out? Is that OK? I should... I mean, he, he is retired, but I, I shouldn't have said that, Angus. Are, you, are we going to leave it in there if we are...? Well, I mean, if, if we're on the record. You said it. I mean, you know, let's, let's move on, but... Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I think I'm done, guys. Uh, you know, I, I, I do this with good intent. You know, I don't do this with bad intent. Oh, that is a shocker of a media performance. This also comes after, as you know, Woolworths faced a fierce backlash when it banned the sale of Australia Day merchandise. It went woke, it engaged in a serious case of virtual signalling and it didn't end well. The clear message is that people didn't want to shop there anymore. They don't want corporates telling them whether they can or can't celebrate Australia Day and what they should think. Well, to discuss this and some of the other top stories of the day, let's bring in the former president of the Victorian Liberal Party, Michael Kroger, and former Labor Cabinet Minister, Graham Richardson. Welcome to you both. Michael, surely Sorry. now Corporate Australia has got to have learned its lesson after this, after The Voice. They should just stick to what they know, stick to turning a profit and stop worrying about social issues. Look, I think uh, uh, they're getting the message. Have they got it completely? No, they haven't. Uh, but Woolworths have suffered shockingly in the eyes of the community, Shari, over the last year. Uh, and I think they're getting the message slowly. You know, you know, Mr Banducci, pack the salads, right? Cut yes. up the carrots and make sure the milk's fresh. Do not lecture people with $2 million worth of shareholders' money about how they should vote for The Voice. Right? Mm. Keep the money in the bank, return it to shareholders, pay it in dividends, whatever. Do not lecture us about these things. And, of course, Australia Day. Here's an idea, Shari. Why don't they, when they say, oh, declining interest, why didn't they make a big thing of it? Why didn't they have big stalls at the front, celebrate Australia Day, et cetera, mm. et cetera? No. This has been a very woke corporation. It's gone bad in the last year. The interview was bad enough, but... Uh, that, I think the interview is nothing compared to how woke this guy has taken and the board have taken Woolworths, and mm. they will suffer a consumer backlash, and I think their brand has been seriously damaged in the last 12 months. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And it, it's a good business. It operates well. You know, their online shopping services work perfectly. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's, it comes down to the culture, the corporate culture. Richo, this has got to be a lesson for other companies as well, doesn't it? And perhaps also a lesson not to go on the ABC because if you ask them to cut something out, they will play it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, look, um, uh, don't start me on the ABC. That We haven't got time. Um, but I think, um, I think, you know, what we've just got to be here is just ordinary common sense tells you which way to go on this stuff. You don't have to, uh, you know, get involved in in uh, elaborate plans, uh, elaborate thinking even, deep thinking. You don't need it here. It's pretty simple. It's also, I think, interesting that um, CEOs now are expected to be brilliant media performers. This is now part of the job. And if they perform badly in the media, if they handle a crisis badly or seem to be badly in the media, like with Optus, then they pay a heavy price for it. 
Uh, now let's turn to these comments by True. Paul Keating today. He did an interview with the Finn Review to mark his 80th birthday. And in it, he spoke about his own age and he compared it to President Biden, who's 81. Paul Keating told the Finn Review that it's no accident people are at their peak in their 40s. You know, certainly I was. And he says that relative infirmity meant that 81-year-old Joe Biden ought to put his cue in the rack <laughs> rather than seek re-election um, in November. Graham, you're a baby compared to both Paul Keating and Joe Biden. You're only in your <laughs> early 70s. What do you think about this suggestion? 75. <laughs> oh, I thought you were 74, so there you go, no. mid-70s. But what do you think about this suggestion that, you know, 80s is too old to run for the presidents? Well, I, it, it, it is too old to run for the president, but we haven't got much choice because if we if we if we don't get him, we get Trump, who's almost eighty. So it's it's six or one half dozen the other in America. I I don't know what they're going to do about it. Uh, I don't know why they can't find better candidates. When I look at you know this massive nation with all the power, all the money, all the intellectual force that they've got, and yet what do you see? Um, two old bumbling fools. Um, we, you know, one of them who doesn't know what room he's in, and the other one has never read a book. It's not very. It's not a very good look. Mm, what do you think about this, Michael Kroger? Well, look. Let's be very clear about this. Joe Biden is not going to be re-elected, right? If he gets re-elected, he doesn't start his second term until January 2025, and his term finishes in January 2029. That's five years away. So the public are not going to vote for him again. Biden mm. is finished. He's not going to be re-elected. There is zero chance of him being re-elected. And, and I think there's probably, Shari, only a 10% chance that he'll be the Democratic Party candidate. Mm. I can't see him getting to the... I can't see him getting to the line. So you've got Gavin Newsom, Michelle Obama. Do not underestimate Kamala Harris. Don't laugh, everybody watching. Kamala Harris, they've got to be pre-selected effectively by the Democratic Convention. The Democratic Convention is extremely left-wing. And Harris's supporters will be saying to her, the only reason your polling numbers are bad is because you're vice president for that silly old fool who can't stand up and doesn't know where he is. That's mm. Kamala, why your, your numbers are in the toilet. They will be giving her enormous enormous encouragement to run. There are reasons why Michelle Obama won't run. There's reasons why uh, Newsom couldn't get elected. I would think Harris has got as good a chance as being the Democratic candidate as anyone because she will be saying, why am I standing aside? I haven't done anything wrong with VP. And she'll be convinced that her problem is because she's VP to Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean, if, if Kamala Harris ends up as the candidate, well, you may as well just keep Joe Biden in there. They're as hopeless as each other for different reasons. Let's turn, mm. let's turn to these reports today from the Times newspaper in the UK about the death of the Russian opposition leader Navalny. Um, the reports are that he was punched in the heart by KGB operatives after he was effectively frozen. He was exposed to sub-zero temperatures in his Arctic prison. Um, this has come from... So it's, it's the Times newspaper, but it, they were attributing it to a human rights group and they said that the bruising on his body was consistent with the one-punch-kill technique that's taught to Russian special forces. Um, Graham, look, this is... We knew... We know he was murdered. Um, the detail about it still is so shocking, even though it's... You know, we, we've known about this for a few days now. Yeah, look, I, I, um, uh, I'm banned from going to Russia. I'm number 127 on Putin's list because I continue to call him a murderous thug. And if you look at what's happened here, he's demonstrated it yet again. He is a murderous thug. Yeah. Look, we're talking about Donald Trump rambling. Well, he finally responded to Navalny's death or murder today. Um, he had this weird post saying the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what's happening in our country, as in America. It is a slow, steady progression with crooked, radical left politicians, prosecutors and judges leading us down a path to destruction, open the borders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Michael, this is a jumbled response <laughs> that really seems to blame America for Navalny's death. I mean, where is the mention of Putin and Russia here? This is the problem with Trump. 
I mean, he's got the right instincts on a whole lot of issues, right, without going through them all. But on, but on, on some foreign policy issues, his instincts on NATO are right, by the way. He made a ridiculous comment about Putin invading, but he's right that they should pay their way. But on the Ukraine, he's been shocking. He's got a blind spot about Putin, no matter what he says. This was a ridiculous comment he made. There is no comparison between the murderous KGB regime, you know, uh, which Putin is in charge of, and the American legal system corrupts, so some parts of that would uh, are. He has a blind spot about some world leaders. This guy, Putin, is one of them. The North Korean dictator is another. Uh, he seems to think the art of the deal, I can palsy up to these guys and I'll solve Ukraine within a day, is what mm. he's saying. Is what he's saying. No, he's incredibly disappointing, incredibly disappointing on some of these issues, and Putin is one of them. His comments are bizarre, Shari. Yeah, I agree. And why it matters so much, it's not just a side issue, is this comes to America playing the role as leader of the free world. We need the US president to do that. It needs to hold Russia to account. Yeah. Russia, China, yeah. Iran, um, North Korea, it's part of the axis of evil. We need to know and be clear-eyed about Correct. who our enemies are. And, you know, Trump seems to be going down some, you know, crazy... Um, obscure right-wing path on this when it comes to Russia and Ukraine. Mm. Very mm. quickly before we have to go, um, Richo, Nikki Haley is still sticking in the race. She had this to say today. Have a look. I feel no need to kiss the ring. I refuse to quit. South Carolina will vote on Saturday. But on Sunday, I'll still be running for president. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Graham, what's this about? She doesn't seem to have any chance of securing the Republican nomination. No, she doesn't, um, which is disappointing in some respects because when I look at her, I think she's all quality. I, I, um, I'm really impressed by her. Um, but uh, she just doesn't have the numbers, as they say. Um, and uh, without them, you don't get too far. Yeah, as you well know, as a famous numbers man, Richo, <laughs> uh, Michael Kroger, Graham Richardson, thank you both so much for joining me tonight. Thank you.